there and welcome to PhD at Living. I recently watched a John Oliver episode talking about PFAS, per and polyfluorinated alkyl substances. It was a good episode per usual, but I think it missed the mark a bit. Here's my half-baked attempt at clearing up a few things that I saw. First, let's talk about the CF carbon fluorine single bond, a rare and beautiful bird if there ever was. Fluorine's the most electronegative atom, which when covalently bonded to carbon, creates a very polar bond. This creates strong dipoles in the molecule, partial positive for carbon, partial negative for fluorine, that are then attracted to each other. This also makes the CF bond very short. The only shorter are BF, SIF, and HF, for those of you playing at home. This combination of strength and length leads to CF bonds having very low reactivity. This means PFAS molecules tend to have extremely long shelf lives, leading to their well-known moniker, Forever Chemicals. This is good, because you don't want to constantly replace the waterproofing on your favorite hiking boots or the nonstick coating on your favorite pan. This is also bad, however, because when you want to dispose of PFAS molecules, there's not a great way to do it. Hence the paradox of the CF bond. Molecules with CF functionality work extremely well for their intended purposes. But when you're done with them, they also still work extremely well, even when you don't necessarily want them to. Quick caveat on the low reactivity statement. In most of the really bad PFAS molecules, it's not the CF bond that's doing the harm directly. Take, for instance, perfluorooctanoic acid, PFOA. That carboxylic acid functionality is pretty reactive anyway, but add 15 fluorine atoms to suck electron density away, and now you have yourself a superacid that does some real harm. So indirectly CF bonds do contribute to some harm, but typically it's not the CF bond itself that's doing the damage. Make sense? Point number two. Small molecules and polymers tend to have different properties. Most sources you see lump in the really bad PFAS actors, like PFOA, with Teflon, a trademark name for the polymer polytetrafluoroethylene, PTFE, or other fluorinated polymers like FEP, fluorinated ethylene propylene. I sometimes work with PTFV at my job, and I don't remember there being any special PPE, especially for as dangerous a molecule as that sounds. I went on Sigma's website and found the SDS for the PTFV we use, and turns out they don't even consider it a hazardous substance. But you look at the SDS from Sigma for PFOA, and you see a bunch of gnarly stuff, like acute toxicity, carcinogenicity, and reproductive harm. So what gives? While both types of molecules have high levels of fluorination on a carbon backbone, there are two huge fundamental differences. Small molecules don't act like big molecules, and the small molecule PFASs tend to have highly reactive functional groups too. It's like substituting cornstarch for sugar in a recipe. It turns out unpolymerized monomers and polymerized polymers tend to have different properties. Take PFOA for instance. That 8 carbon backbone is small enough that it has much higher mobility in the environment. PTFE, on the other hand, is polymerized to many thousands of units, so its solubility is way lower in the environment and, you know, humans. The other problem with the small molecule PFASs is they tend to have those highly reactive functional groups, like PFOA has that carboxylic acid functionality, which increases hydrophilicity and solubility again in the environment and your body. The CF bond causes problems mostly from a bioaccumulation standpoint. The body doesn't have a good way to metabolize that CF bond to dispose of it. Though I'm not sure you'd want to be able to metabolize the CF bond anyway, but I digress. There was a dude in the Oliver piece testifying before Congress that the PTFE mesh in his hernia would create devil's piss if he was ever cremated. Well, that sure sounds bad, but let's look at the reverse of that. That dude has a PTFE mesh in his body right now. Why would the medical community allow that if PFASs were so dangerous? Could it be that the PTFE is completely unreactive and insoluble in the essentially aqueous environment of the human body, and thus it would last his entire life without needing to be replaced and posing essentially no harm whatsoever to him? Damn, that actually sounds pretty sweet. To clarify, I'm not saying all PFAS molecules are good and should be indiscriminately dumped into the water supply, but I am saying there's more nuance here than just condemning anything with a CF bond as a cancerous scourge on the earth. Which brings us to our next point. Decomposition products are different from raw materials. Devil's piss sure doesn't sound like a lot of fun, and it's a common name for hydrofluoric acid, HF. We've talked HF before on this channel, and it's a truly horrible chemical from an occupational safety standpoint. But insinuating that HF and PTFE are essentially the same is disingenuous at best, especially because you only get HF from literally burning the PTFE. 
I can give you a host of things that create harmful decomposition products when they're burned, like the foam in this couch I'm sitting on right now, the plastics in the camera that I'm filming this video with, and then the computer I'll be uploading it to YouTube on, the coolant in my air conditioner and refrigerator. And these are all things that are in my house right now! Don't get me wrong, it'd be super if chemicals decomposed into sunshine and rainbows when they weren't used as intended, but we're chemists, not alchemists. Some of us are good, even damn good, but not that good. This is a great place to remind us of points one and two. PTFE is bad when it decomposes, but the strength of the CF bond means it doesn't do so in all but the most extreme of scenarios. PFOA, on the other hand, is bad right now, today, in raw form. And that makes a world of difference. Listen, it stinks that stuff decomposes into harmful products, but that doesn't mean you should write it off in and of itself just because of that. Which brings us to our next point. Chemicals don't kill people, people kill people. This is admittedly a weak-ish argument, but PFOA really isn't a problem unless it gets into the environment, right? If properly contained and used responsibly, its only purpose would be the creation of products with legitimate use, like Congress dude's hernia mesh that keeps him from being in pain. Think of it this way. There's lots of animals at the zoo that would kill or eat people if given the chance, but they're properly contained, so that bad scenario never happens. What John Oliver mentioned in passing, but I consider to be the root problem of this whole thing, is this. PFAS existence, while inconvenient, isn't the problem. PFAS regulation is the problem. We wouldn't be having all the troubles we're seeing today if companies hadn't been dumping tons of PFAS into the water supply, would we? To be fair, maybe at least partly what with waterproofing on clothing and hiking boots and stuff rubbing off and nonstick pans being disposed in dumps, but certainly not to the levels we're currently observing. Irresponsible use of pretty much anything is going to be bad. To blame the chemicals themselves for their illegal disposal clouds the issue of who's really at fault. The people making and using the chemicals. Which brings us to our last point, the trouble of eliminating PFAS use. Who's making and using PFAS molecules and why? Heartless capitalistic companies who don't care about the proletariat and only care about money and shareholders. That's half joking, but if there weren't a market for these PFAS molecules, companies wouldn't have a compelling interest to make or work with them. There are lots of chemicals I don't want to work with at my job, but customers want them, so guess I work with them anyway. Here's the rub. There are a number of legitimate uses for PFAS molecules that no other class of compound can be substituted for. We've already talked about medical devices, but there are others. However, there are also purposes that can have reasonable substitutes for the PFAS molecules, and there are others that can have the PFAS molecule eliminated entirely, like in some cosmetics and dental floss. The broken record continues. To lump all of these molecules and their purposes together misses out on some badly needed nuance. One final note. Last Week Tonight references a website that lists local PFAS data on it, and it's pretty good for the most part. While browsing, I saw a notification for my hometown. You know, the place where I spent 18 years drinking the water. Turns out, in 2019, the PFOA level was 2.6 million parts per trillion, with a recommended upper limit of 500 parts per trillion. Yeah. Not all was lost, though. As a good skeptic does, I dug around and found the source before I freaked the heck out and started notifying people on Facebook that we're all going to get cancer soon. Turns out there was a unit conversion error from the raw data to the website. That 2.6 million parts per trillion was actually 2.6 nanograms per liter on the raw data website. Nanograms per liter is parts per trillion, so the reference website accidentally multiplied it by a million, getting that 2.6 million PPT number. So it's still a good website, but make sure to do your own sourcing before you go nuts. In summary, the CF bond is an extremely unique chemical species that has both incredible and incredibly paradoxical benefits. Not all molecules with CF functionality act the same, and the reason is usually not directly tied to the CF group in the first place. Some PFAS molecules can be dangerous now, and some can be dangerous when they decompose, but suggesting the ones that can be dangerous when they decompose are dangerous when they're sitting at ambient conditions can be misleading. While some PFAS molecules are better off being uninvented, what really caused the problem was a lack of good regulation and a lot of corporate and ethical irresponsibility. What we can do about that now is to establish better rules on what PFASs can be manufactured and what products they can go into. And that, my friends, are some thoughts about something I watched on TV that had to do with chemicals. Now I'm going to go watch something else on TV, like The New Dune. See you next time. The Franciscan monks thought they were making white wine. Somehow the bottle carbonated, voila, champagne, and the whole thing. The gas, Dr. Goodspeed. Oh, it's very, very horrible, sir. 
It's one of those things we wish we could disinvent.